Good afternoon and welcome to this incredible experience for all of you who are sitting here and for all of us who have had the chance to meet Jennifer Thompson Canino, who along with Ron Carter, <laughs> along with uh, Mr. Ron Cotton, wrote this incredible book describing an extraordinary journey. And I'm so pleased to see so many folks here, the students. This is an amazingly busy time on the campus. It's a tribute, I think, to the faculty, to the students who've taken this work, this incredible work, and really brought it to themselves and also with others as you work with your classmates. It isn't often that we're able to actually meet the author of the book chosen for the common read. The faculty who've been involved, Beth and Jean and Susan, Madeira, so many of the faculty in all of our departments have really used this opportunity effectively. And I think that for those of you in today in the audience and perhaps as you share what you learned through the book and through this conversation today. It's a very special, special opportunity that we offer at Queensboro, and we're so grateful to have Ms. Thompson Canino with us. She's come all the way from North Carolina. She brought the sunshine. <laughs> and of course, we told her, you're our bright lights always. So by the way, I'm Diane Call. I always forget to introduce myself. I'm very happy to be the president of Queensboro, and I'm particularly happy to welcome Jennifer and thank her so very much for sharing her experience and the life lessons that we can all take from her book and her journey. So thank you and welcome. Hello, I am Professor Jean Murley from the English department and I'd like to welcome you all to our special event today. I'm just gonna say a few words and then we're gonna hear from Jennifer herself. So the first thing I wanna ask you is, let me see a show of hands, how many of you have read Picking Cotton? <laughs> yes. All right, another show of hands, how many of you love Picking Cotton? <laughs> yes. I love to see that. I love to see that. It's so meaningful to me because I care so deeply about the issues in the book. And I'm just so happy to see so many of you here today to support this event. So first, I wanted to give a very special thank you to President Call for supporting the event today. Without her support and assistance, this event would not have happened. So let's have a round of applause for President Call. Thank you so much. Secondly, I need to and want to especially thank the following people for their support. Susan Madera, the director of the Common Read Program, Vice President Paul Marchese, David Humphreys, chair of the English department, uh, the president's executive assistant, Millie Conti, and I'd also like to especially thank Kathleen Landy and Glenn Birdie. They couldn't be here today, but they helped a lot. Thank you also to the Common Read Committee for choosing the book for this year's read. And I want to thank all the faculty members who have supported the book and taught it in their classes. I want to thank you students for reading it and caring about the book, caring about the issues and engaging with them. Very special thank you for Beth Cunahan, who has helped me put this together today. Olga Salamanca, B&G, the folks at QPAC, many, many more. I would mostly like to thank Jennifer Thompson for taking time out of her busy schedule to come talk to us today. Jennifer flew in from North Carolina yesterday just for you guys, just for you guys. So as you know from reading the book, Jennifer is the co-author of Picking Cotton and very briefly, she survived a brutal rape in 1984. And because of a combination of factors, including the frailties of human memory and a flawed police lineup procedure, 
The wrong man, Ronald Cotton, was convicted of that crime. Once Ronald was exonerated through DNA, Jennifer and Ronald became friends and they wrote the book Picking Cotton together. Picking Cotton became a bestseller and has given Jennifer and Ronald the opportunity to share their story of injustice and redemption with the world. We know this part of the story, right? We read the book. But what you might not know is that Jennifer continues to advocate both for people who've been harmed by wrongful conviction and for victims of sexual assault. Her story and her ongoing work is powerful, compelling, and extremely important. She's gonna to talk to you today about her life and her work, so please help me give a huge QCC welcome to Jennifer Thompson. So I kind of feel like I want to take my shoes off. Um, I don't know who ever invented these silly things, but good Lord. But I'm not going to take my shoes off because I'm going to be proper. <laughs> um, I met with Jean back in, the, in January, I think, when I came up to do some work at the Brooklyn DA's office, and um, we sat in a coffee shop with my executive director, and she told me that Picking Cotton had been chosen for Queensborough Community College Common Read, and I thought, well, gosh, that's really interesting. How come you're not bringing me there? And she said, well, I'm not sure if, it, if we can do that, and you know, budget and stuff. And I said, well, let's make it happen. You, you gotta get me there. The kids need me there, and, and, I, and I need to be with the kids. So. We've been working over the next, the last couple of months to get me um, here. And so I am thrilled. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk a little bit later about, you know, picking cotton afterwards. But right now I'm going to, um, I'm going to kind of talk to you about the stuff that you already know, but a little bit deeper maybe, get into some of the nuances of, um, of what was happening during the early years and, and how this all started. And I often say, particularly to young people, um, we often think we get to pick our journeys in life, you know, that you kind of, you, you make these little goals and you set your little path and, and you start walking along and, and, and everything's kind of controlled and, and predicted. But the reality is, more often than not, I find that the journeys pick us. Like things happen in our lives we have to respond to it. We have a decision to make. And it sets you on a different, a, a road that you never thought that you'd go on. And that's, of course, exactly what's happened in my life. I mean, I was not supposed to do this. I was supposed to be a physical therapist. That was the plan. You know, it's 1984. I'm not much older than most of you sitting out here. I was 22. Um, I had gone through the proverbial uh, making bad choices when you're 18 and 19. I had dated the wrong guys, and, and so finally by the time I'm 22 years old and I'm in college, I had my life sort of together, much to the, to the amazement of my parents. I was finally dating the right guy who had um, you know, a, a career in front of him, came from a really good family, a very, very respected family in the Burlington, North Carolina community. I was maintaining a 4.0 GPA, um, which surprised me as well as my parents. Um, and I had my own little apartment. I was so proud of my little apartment. I decorated it in my peach and pale blue, which, by the way, was the trend at the time. Um, and I worked. I worked two jobs. And it was important for me to be an independent young woman. I'm 22, and I really wanted to pay my own bills. And my parents said, you don't have to. We can help. But you know, I'm 22, and I, I really want to do this. So I'm working hard at my job. I'm working hard in school. I'm kind of doing the right things, what we're supposed to be doing. And of course, July 28th of 1984 comes around. And I'd gone out with my boyfriend that day. And it wasn't, it wasn't an atypical day. It was pretty normal. I mean, we'd gone to play tennis. And we were going to go out that night for dinner and, and then end up at a summer party. And, um, and of course, by the time I get to the party, I'm not feeling so good. I had played tennis and gotten dehydrated. And how many of you people have ever been in North Carolina in July? I mean, like, it is hot. 
You drink the air. It's so humid. And so playing tennis at noon is usually not a good idea. But that's what we had done. So by 9 o'clock, I had not rehydrated enough. I had eaten way too much, which I have a habit of doing even now. Um, and so by 9, I had a headache and told my boyfriend, please take me home. I, I, I need to go to bed. And he was the polite young man that he should be. He took me home and gave me some aspirin, some water. And it's about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and, and I fell asleep. Now, the apartment was old. These were apartments that had been built in the 1950s, way before we had central air. So you would have a window air conditioner unit. You guys have seen those. Dorms have them, right? And, and in the summer in North Carolina, they're on 24-7. Like, they never shut off. And they're really loud. And so in my apartment, it was, it was pretty typical that if I wanted to watch television, I had to turn my air conditioner off if I wanted to hear the TV. And so you'd sweat. But if you wanted to be cool, you'd have the AC on, but you couldn't hear the television. And you, had, you couldn't do both. And um, this particular night, of course, the air conditioner was running 1,000 miles an hour. And you couldn't hear anything. Sometime around 3 o'clock in the morning, um, I felt this very uncomfortable feeling. Now, girls will often say that this happens to them a lot. You're sleeping. You think you might hear something. It's uncomfortable. It's disconcerting. You wonder if you're actually hearing the noise, if you're dreaming, if you're having a nightmare. And if you, if you were actually experiencing it, if there was really something in the, in the room with you, if there was somebody in your room, could you make yourself wake up? Could you will yourself to wake up in the event there was somebody in the room with you? Or is it just easier to stay asleep? And you're in that place in between, right? And that's what happened to me that particular morning of July 29th at 3 o'clock. I felt a very uncomfortable presence. I lived alone. I wasn't sure if it was real, if I was imagining it. Something brushed against my left arm. And as I turned my head to the left side of my mattress, I noticed the top of someone's head. I could hear his feet shuffling on the carpet. Now, you just opened your eyes and you're in that place where you're trying to make sense. So the first thought I had was, well, this has got to be my boyfriend. He's, he's fallen asleep on my floor. He's trying to be polite. He doesn't want to wake me up as he leaves. But the reality of that was that my boyfriend never spent the night with me, ever. His mother and father were first-generation Greek. And I love Greek people, by the way. And I particularly love their food. But his mother needed to know where her children were every minute of the day. So whenever he came into town, he always stayed at his parents' house. He never spent the night with me. So I knew that this was not my boyfriend. And I, of course, said, who is that who's there? And a man quickly jumped up on my bed. As I screamed, he covered my mouth with a gloved hand. And I very quickly felt a knife go to the left side of my throat. But again, I've only been awake for seconds at this point. And so the brain processes information. If you've ever seen a car accident, the brain processes information in what I like to call nanoseconds. It's flooding in so fast. You're trying to make logic out of illogic. And so my first thought was, this has got to be a joke. Like, this has got to be some stupid frat boy who thinks this is going to be really funny, and he's going to look at me and go, ha ha, just kidding, just all a joke. But again, that scenario was impossible. I lived three and a half miles off of campus. Nobody knew me. I didn't hang out on campus. I didn't go to parties. I didn't hang out in the college bars. I went to class. I studied. I went to work. And I dated my boyfriend at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. People didn't know me. I didn't have an active social life. Well, then it's got to be 
a break-in. Someone's broken into my apartment. I've startled him. I'll give him my money. I'll give him my car. I'll give him anything he wants. And I said, please, please, don't hurt me. You can have my car. My, my keys are, are in my purse. You can have my money. You can take my credit cards. I won't call the police, I promise. Please don't hurt me. And having no idea, he had already cut my phone lines. And he looked at me and he said, I don't want your money. Now, every rape survivor I've ever talked to will tell you that they know. You know what's going to happen. You know you're going to be raped. But what you don't know is are you going to die? Is this the last minute I have on this planet? And you start thinking to yourself, is it going to hurt? Well, I feel it. Maybe it'll be fast and I won't know. Or maybe it's going to be slow and painful and it's going to take me a long time before I die. And those are the thoughts that go through your mind. How am I going to die? And how long will it take me before I'm dead? And then you start thinking to yourself, I just need to tell my dad and my mom how much I love them. I want to be able to tell them one more time, thank you for everything you've ever done for me. And I love you. And those are the things that go through your mind. And then something really strange happened. I remember laying there thinking, I may die and you may kill me, but it's not going to be here. It will not be on my back. There's got to be a way for me to survive. I'm smart. I'm a 4.0 GPA. I'm smart. I can figure this thing out. I, I have to. Rape survivors will often talk about that they have this out-of-body experience, right? That they leave their physical self, that they can actually see themselves being harmed from above. And I can remember thinking to myself that I had to stay present. I had to stay there. I had to. My sister, who's three years younger than me, had just gone for a walk the week before, and we had the conversation about what would you ever do if you knew you were going to be raped. And my sister, who's, who's, who's always been someone who was up for a fight, said, I would rip his eyes out. I would bite him. I would vomit on him. I would kick him. I will punch him. And I said, well, you know, I've read that if you stay calm, you might survive. And that conversation came back to me at that moment, that I had to stay calm, I had to stay present, I had to stay in that body, and I had to make sure that I was looking in his face as he raped me because I was going to remember everything about this person's face. I was going to burn his image into my brain, and I would watch him rot in hell. And over the next 20 minutes as he raped me, I would find those moments to remember what his eyes were shaped like, what his mouth looked like, if he had a scar, did he have a tattoo, did he have a piercing. Anything and everything that I could remember that he couldn't change later on became my absolute survival. I had to remember. I had to. At one point, he tried to kiss my mouth, and I can remember thinking, I'm going to vomit, and I'm going to choke to death on my own vomit. So I turned my head to the right, and that would save my life when he said, relax, baby. I'm not going to hurt you. And for some reason that I can't explain, I said, well, I'm afraid of knives. If you'll just get off of me and take the knife out the front door and drop it on the hood. I'll let you come back in. And he looked at me really strange, and he said, really? And I knew that the power had just shifted. It wasn't a lot, but, but I needed it. And I said, I promise, please get off of me. I grabbed a blanket at the edge of my bed, and I wrapped it around me. I remember him saying, you don't need that blanket. And I had to make up something very quick. And I said, well, I'm really cold. I just, I just need 
something to keep me warm because I had planned to run and I didn't want to be running without anything on. But it also gave me the, the opportunity to see in close enough to him to figure out how tall is this man because they were going to ask me that. I knew they would ask me how tall was the assailant, how much did he weigh, what were his clothes. And I had to remember everything, that he was five foot eleven, about six feet tall, based on the fact that I'm five foot one and I weighed about 105 pounds, so he's 175, maybe 185 pounds. I remembered everything. He had canvas, dark boat shoes that you slipped on, you didn't tie them, and, and, and khaki fatigue pants that were like a gray or an olive green, a blue shirt that had three white stripes across his bicep, because everything that I could remember was paramount to me surviving that night. He walked to the front door and pretended to drop the knife out and quickly came back in and grabbed my arm and said, let's go, and I was not going to go back in that room. I would die in that hallway before I ever let him touch me. I need to use the bathroom. Could I just have a moment, please? And he said, hurry up, make it fast. As I went into the bathroom, I turned the light on just for a second before he yelled at me to turn it off, but it was an important second. It was light in close proximity. That was going to be important. They were going to ask me, how much light did you have? And as I went into the bathroom, I remember starting to pray because I didn't have a plan. I didn't know what to do now. I couldn't fit through the window. It was small, and there was a drop all the way down to a basement that if I did get through the window, I'd probably break my legs in the fall. And then I remember he had said he had come through my kitchen, through the back door. If I could somehow get to that door, maybe... Just maybe it was still open. Uh, could I have a drink of water, please, first? And he said, yeah, make me a Seagram's and we'll have a party. I said, okay, I'll make you a Seagram's. See, he had been in my apartment for a long time. He knew what I had in my apartment. He had gone through my wallet. He had taken my money. He knew my name was Jennifer. He knew that I wore glasses. He knew I was from Winston-Salem. He had gone through my photo albums and taken photographs of me out as a souvenir as I made my way to the kitchen, he turned the stereo on looking for a specific radio station, 98.7 KISS FM, because he thought we were going to have a party. But as I walked by, the light came off the stereo. It illuminated his profile, and again, it was another image that I could get that I could remember. It would be important later on. I got to the kitchen and quickly turned the lights on because I, know, I knew it would give me space, it would give me time, it would give me distance, it would give me five seconds, it would give me ten feet, but I needed that as I began to make noise in the kitchen with ice cubes and water running and cabinet doors opening and shutting. And I remember pulling my blanket tight and saying a prayer, and I ran. It's 3.30 now in the morning, and it's dark, it's raining, the grass is slippery. I'm not a particularly fast person. I didn't know where to go. I thought I'll go next door to 27D and I'll bang on the door and he'll let me in, but I didn't know he was gone for the weekend. As I looked over my right shoulder, I could see him coming out of the apartment after me and he was angry. He was angry and I knew that he was going to kill me. So I just took off through the neighborhood and did the only thing that made any sense to me, the only logic, which was to get to light. If I could get to some light under a street light, anything, and if he starts to kill me, maybe somebody will drive by. Maybe somebody will see it. Maybe they'll call the police and they'll save me. So I jumped a dog fence and ended up in a carport of a home that I had no idea who lived there banging on the back door, screaming, please, please, please let me in. I've been raped. Please let me in. And the man who lived there with his wife and children came to the door and looked at me through the glass and just screamed. But the wife came behind him and said, my God, she's a student at the college. I see her every day on campus. Let her in. And she happened to be a professor. I quickly fainted, and they called 911, and the police came, and they had canines and tried to pick up his scent, but the rain had already washed the scent away, and it was lost, and I'd be taken to the hospital. 
It would be at the hospital that I would learn what a rape kit was. That my body now had become the crime scene and the evidence was left on me and in me and it had to be collected and plucked and probed and swabbed and put in neat little plastic bags sealed as evidence. And I can remember thinking to myself that you could just take my skin. You can have it. I don't want it. I hate it. I don't ever want to feel my skin again. A few moments later, that was when I would hear the deep, deep crying of the woman in the room next to me, the screaming crying. And I would learn that she had just been raped by the same man. That in under an hour and in less than a mile, he had crawled through her den window when she was sleeping and punched her and bitten her and slapped her and put a pillow over her face and a flashlight in her eyes and raped her. And I hated this man with a hate that I have never, ever felt since then. I mean, it was a hate that came up from the bottom of my stomach and burned in the back of my throat, and I would have shot him between the eyes and walked away smiling. I hated this man. I had gone to bed on July 28th, Jennifer Thompson. I mean, a girl of infinite possibilities. I was going to graduate school. I was going to graduate valedictorian. And in 30 minutes, he had destroyed my entire life. That girl died that night. And I would never see her again. And I hated him with a rage. When the officers asked me, did you get a good look at him? I said, I did. I really did. I know exactly what he looks like. I want to help. We have to remove him off the streets. He's going to harm other women. He's an animal. He's a menace to society. He has to be taken down. I want to help, please. And I began to give so much information that it was so clear I'd gotten such a good look at him. I was asked if I could do a composite sketch. And I said, yes, I want to. I want to help you. He's going to harm other people. And working with a police artist, we were able to put together the composite sketch. And when they asked me, does this look like the man who raped you? I said, yes, it does. It looks just like him. The composite sketch ran in the newspapers. It was on the news. You couldn't turn on the news without seeing this composite sketch. And it led to leads, but the most important lead was from a woman who called in and said, that composite sketch looks like this guy by the name of Ronald Cotton. You need to take a look at him because he rides a bicycle through that area all the time wearing white gloves. He's got a navy blue shirt with white sleeves and stripes on, on the sides. As a matter of fact, I saw him on a bicycle around 3 o'clock in the morning at Brookwood Garden Garden Condominium Complex on July 29th. Ronald had had a criminal history. His mugshot was pulled. It was put into a photographic lineup. I was called on August the 1st to come down and view it. Ms. Thompson, we're going to show you six photographs. Don't feel compelled to choose anybody. Suspect Mary may not be in here, but if you see him, pick up the picture and initial the back of it. And I said, okay, I mean, I can do this. I'm a straight A student. I always find the right answers. And I found it. I picked up the photograph. I said, this is him. Are you sure? I'm positive. Good job. That's who we thought it was. And the relief was huge. He was going to be removed. He would be arrested. On August the 10th, I was called back down to the police station to do a physical lineup. Now, I had seen physical lineups in cop shows, right, where you go into the room and there's that one-way glass and you see them and they can't see you because you're protected. But this particular room was being renovated. So I was taken to an old schoolhouse on the second floor, brought into a room, And the only thing between me and the seven men in the lineup was a table. No mirrors, no glass, nothing. Me, a table, and seven men in a lineup. 
And I, my knees were shaking. I was fighting the urge to not throw up. And it was, I was sweating. I thought I was going to just die. But I saw him. It was number five. I mean, his hair was longer than I had remembered, but it had been like 12 days now, and he was wearing brown and not blue, and he was probably trying to throw off my memory, but I remember, it's number five, I wrote it on a piece of paper, and they said, good job, that's who you picked out in the photograph. And again, the relief was enormous. I had gotten it right. I had been a good victim. He was going to go to trial. This is the way it's supposed to be. I would prepare like it was the most important final exam of my life. I wanted to know everything about this person, who he was, who his family was, where he had gone to school. I wanted to know everything about him. In January of 1985, State versus Cotton went to trial. Two weeks of my life, I had to sit in there and listen to the lies one after another about where Ronald Cotton had been on July 29th. And I knew where he had been. He had been in my apartment raping me. Two days, I had to say everything over and over again, every disgusting detail of what he did to me in front of my father as the defense attorneys began to try to assassinate my character because how dare I wear underwear to bed? How dare I walk around in my apartment in just my underwear? Didn't I know that that's what brings rapists in? Wasn't it my fault? The jury deliberated four hours and came back with the only conclusion, and that is Ronald Cotton was guilty of all charges, and he would be sentenced to life in 54 years. And it was the first time I could breathe. We went back to the district attorney's office, and we had champagne. We toasted the criminal justice system because it worked for me, the victim. That's the way it's supposed to work. You're going to die in prison, and that's what you deserve because you are a horrible human being. You don't deserve to breathe the same air I breathe. And then they would pat you on the head, and they would say, now, Jennifer, you get to move on. You get to put your life back together again. Move forward. But I had nothing to move on to. I had nothing to move forward to because my boyfriend couldn't handle me. I needed a lot of support. And my friends didn't want to go out with me because I cried a lot. And I wasn't a lot of fun. And my grades began to slip. And I wasn't going to be valedictorian. And I wasn't going to graduate summa cum laude. And I wasn't going to go get my master's degree. And the only thing I knew to get through day after day were drugs and alcohol. Because if I could numb for just a few hours, if I could just not feel this skin, then it was worth it. Until... April when I almost died and I woke up from like a 36 hour drug induced stupor and I remember thinking to myself if I die he wins and I'm just not I'm just too mean for that I'm not going to let him win I somehow crawled back up out of the bowels of hell, graduated in May of 1985, left North Carolina, moved to Long Island, New York, missed the grits and biscuits, and moved back the next year, and got a job in a bank. Met a new man, fell in love, and by 1987, the North Carolina Courts of Appeal had overturned the decision. New trial, they said, because, see, there had been this second victim who couldn't make an ID. And maybe since she couldn't make an ID, perhaps my memory had been wrong. Perhaps I had just gotten it wrong. Fortunately, now she remembered three years later that it was indeed Ronald Cotton. She was just afraid she'd be willing to testify to that. And of course she remembered. How do you forget that, right? I mean, you wish you could forget it, but you can't forget that. Ronald Cotton had come up with a theory that he was innocent, 
that the actual perpetrator, some guy by the name of Bobby Poole, was running around prison bragging that he had committed the crimes that Ronald Cotton was in prison for. But the problem with that is that these are felons, and felons lie. And who are you going to believe, a convicted felon or me? So in November of 1987, we went back to court, State versus Cotton, except this time Ronald Cotton would be tried for both rapes. Under Vordier, they would bring this man, Bobby Poole, into the court. Mr. Poole, did you commit these crimes? No, nah, I never committed those crimes. Did you say you committed those crimes? No, nah, I never said I committed those crimes. Ms. Thompson, do you recognize this man? No, Your Honor, I've never seen him before in my life. Is the man in the courtroom today that raped you? Yes, Your Honor, it's Ronald Cotton. And that would be all they needed to know. And so this time, Ronald would be found guilty of two first three rapes, two first three break and enterings, and two first three sex offenses. And this time, Ronald would be given two life sentences and 30 years. And again, I would breathe a sigh of relief. And again, I would drink champagne and I would toast the system because Ronald Cotton was going to die in prison. And that is what he deserved. I got married in 1988. In the fall of 1989, I got pregnant. In the spring of 1990, I gave birth to Morgan, Blake, and Brittany. The happiest day of my life. It was evidence to me that God loved me, that I was a good person, that I deserved these children, that, that God trusted me to raise them. And that was my reward after everything I had suffered. And wasn't it wonderful that Ronald was never going to have this, that he would never hold his own child, that he would never fall in love. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And at night when I would tuck them into bed and I would kiss them goodnight and I would go back into my room and I would pray for their safety, I would end every prayer with, please have Ronald die tonight. And on his way to hell, I wanted him to know what that moment was like for me, that incredible loss of control, that you don't get to decide who touches your body and who doesn't. And then I wanted him to die. Because it's okay when good people pray for bad things to happen to bad people. It's fine. God understands that. And I would pray that prayer for five years until the spring of 1995 when Mike Galden, the investigator, would come to my house and look at me and say, you know, have you ever heard of this thing called DNA? And I said, well, yeah, I know what DNA is. Why? Well, Ronald still claims he's innocent, but we know he's not. We know we got it right. But the problem is if the courts allow this post-conviction DNA testing to go through, your rape kit is broken. It's all been lost. And we need a new blood sample. You don't have to consent, but the courts will probably order it. And I said to them, well, you know what? So here's the thing, guys. I got five-year-old triplets, and I'm busy. Like, I'm really busy. And I don't have time to go to court. So I'm going to give you the blood today. We're going to go to the lab. I'm going to give you that blood, and you're going to run that test because I'm done with this. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. It's too hard. And they said, okay, that'd be fine. And we went to the lab, and I had the blood drawn, and I gave them the vials, and off it went to the lab to have the DNA testing run. And March rolled into April, and April rolled into May, and May rolled into June. And I didn't think about the results because I knew what the re results were going to show. Except they came back into my house, and they stood in my kitchen the first week of June, and they looked at me, and they said, Jennifer... It's not Ronald's DNA. It's Bobby Poole's. Now, people like to ask me, what was that like? Like, what did you think about? What did you do? And the answer is, I don't know. I just don't know. I, I remember feeling that the earth opened up and somehow I got swallowed. I remember feeling guilt. I remember feeling sorrow, but I remember feeling fear, like deep, deep fear, because Ronald's coming out 
he's going to be exonerated. How angry is this man? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my children? Am I safe? Are my children safe? What do I do? I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to say. And so for the next year, I would become the paranoid mother. The children weren't allowed to answer the door. They couldn't go near the phone and answer the phone. They weren't to be left alone ever, not for one minute, because behind every tree, behind every corner, was going to be Ronald Cotton lurking, and he was going to kill me. And I was pretty confident about that, because I would, I'd hate you. In the summer of 1996, I got a phone call by a man from a man named Ben Loderman out of Boston, Massachusetts. He wanted to do this, this documentary all about the fallibility of eyewitness ID, about how memory works under trauma. And wouldn't it be great if I told my story in a video so that he can put that on television for millions and millions and millions of people to watch and then hate me? Wasn't that a great idea? Didn't I want to do that? And I said, no, I don't have any desire. No, why would I ever want to tell my story in public? That's a terrible idea. He said, well, Ronald's going to tell his story. And I thought, well, dang it, because if Ronald tells his story, who is going to tell my story? And if they get it wrong, that could be really, really bad. So I'll tell you what, I'll do it on one condition, and that is that Ronald Cotton stays in Burlington, North Carolina, and I am going to do it in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and we're not going to see each other because he's going to kill me. And they said, okay, that'd be fine. <laughs> so over the fall of 1996, as we began to put together what Jennifer saw, they would come to my house, and they would stand there, and they'd go, oh, you know what, we were at Ron's house yesterday, and he is the nicest person. I mean, he is just so sweet and kind and loving and gentle, kind of like a gentle giant, like a big teddy bear. He's just so sweet. And I remember thinking, this is a conspiracy. Like, you're all in it. Like, you're all trying to lure me to my death, and I'm going to get into a room, and he's going to jump out, and everybody's going to go, ha! Ah, that can't be possible. That's not possible. In February of 1997, what Jennifer saw aired to millions and millions of people on Frontline PBS. And the last thing I say in the documentary is, I know that he's innocent, but I still see him in my nightmares. And the last thing Ronald says is, I know she's sorry, but I really need to hear that from her. And that's when it hit me. I have to go see the man. I don't know the man. I know what I've, I've, I've created in my mind, but I don't know the man. And so in a small church, about a mile and a half from where I had been raped 13 years before, I sat in a pastor's study and I waited for this man. I didn't know what I was going to say. I couldn't even figure out what I was going to call him. But before I could get my mind together, this huge six-foot-four man is standing in the doorway, and I remember just not being able to breathe. I remember sobbing, not crying, sobbing. And I looked at him and I said, Ronald, if I spent every second of every minute of every hour of every day telling you I'm sorry, can you ever forgive me? And Ronald took my hands and started to cry, and he said, Jennifer, I forgave you years ago. I'm not angry. Not at you. We spent the next two hours talking about what those years had been like, the loss that both of us had suffered, the fear, the trauma, the harm, all because of a single individual by the name of Bobby Poole. And Bobby Poole was the creator of all the harm. Bobby Poole had tried to kill me. Bobby Poole had raped a second woman. Bobby Poole went on to rape six more women in the fall of 1984 and the spring of 1985. And Bobby Poole sat back and watched Ronald Cotton be arrested and tried and convicted for the crimes that he committed. That day, we ended up in each other's arms in the parking lot, hugging, and promising each other this had been our journey together and this was just the beginning. 
he and I have become best friends. He has become um, a spiritual leader for me. He helped me understand grace and mercy. He taught me what forgiveness truly is. He allowed me to be free for the first time in 13 years. Um, he is truly one of my greatest blessings outside of Morgan, Blake, and Brittany in the world. I was with him this week. Um, he's a lovely man. He's one of my best friends, and I don't, I don't believe that I could be standing here today. As a matter, I know I could not be standing here today if it wasn't for his love. So I'm going to end with that, and thank you. So now we're going to, Jennifer and I are going to have a conversation. Y'all uh, can, can hear, right? Yeah. And uh, I have some questions from that, that your professors have sent that have filtered up to me from you, and some questions that I've prepared on my own, and we're going to do that now. It's on. It's on. Don't go anywhere because this is the okay. best part. <laughs> yeah, this is the best part. Don't go nowhere. This is where you get to hear what I've been doing all these years. Okay. So the first question is we want to know how you came to write the book with Ronald and what inspired you and motivated you to take on such a huge project. And then can you tell us a little bit about the aftermath, when the book became a bestseller, was it surprising to you? What that's been like for you? So both the process of, of writing the book and putting it together, and then the aftermath of the book. Yeah, sure. Um, so part of that, you know, when I started off talking to you all today, it was about the journey, right? And do you choose the journey? Does the, the journey choose you all? And so when Ronald and I met in that church in 1997, and people ask us this all the time, like n nothing was planned. Everything we have done is very organic. And um, so, you know, we, we, we met and then we did a couple interviews and we did a couple of television things and slowly and slowly we began to build our relationship and people would come up to us and say, oh, y'all need to write a book. And the reality is Ronald had never gotten out of ninth grade. And um, getting him to really sit down and think about writing was gonna be quite a task. And I had written over the years my story, but I knew that we had to find a third person. It was going to be really important to find that third person, but that third person was going to be really key because we would have people that would come up and say, I am supposed to be your writer. And I said, really, tell me why you're supposed to be our writer. And then they would tell me something really cheesy like, well, I'm supposed to be your writer um, because I've already got the title of the book. And I said, really? I already had the title of the book, by the way. It was called Picking Cotton. In my head, I knew it was Picking Cotton. And they said, it's going, the rape of Jennifer Thompson. <laughs> like, that's like the stupidest title I've ever heard. You can't be on our team. And then we had another person that came up. She said, I'm supposed to be your writer for the book. And I was like, really, really? And then she called me up. She was like, you know what? This book is never going to sell. It's just, no one's going to read it. And I said, really, tell me why you say that. Well, she, well, because it's just not very sexy, which has always been an interesting term when you talk about our story. And she said, it had been different, like if you and Ron had gotten married, that would be really cool. I was like, so you can't be the writer either. You're not on the team. But Erin kind of fell out of the sky for us. And she called me and she said, you know, I'd really like to talk to you guys about being part of this. And we talked to her for a few minutes, and, and I told her, I said, listen, the title of the book is Picking Cotton. And it's going to be written in split narrative first person. Here's my part. Here's the way it's going to work. Here's, here's the sequence. And she looked at me, and she said, yep, it's exactly the way it's supposed to be. So I was like, okay, you can be on the team. Um, and so, you know, 
But none of it, like I said, none of it was planned. People were trying to buy our life rights. People were trying to turn our, our story into some awful Hallmark movie. And, and you know, you know, and in life you know when things are right and you know when things are wrong. And so all along, we really believed that the universe, universe was just going to kind of work the way it was supposed to work in our, in our lives. Um, and so it was really an interesting process. It was published in um, March of 2009. And, and honestly, um, I never, in a million years, I knew it was a good story because I already lived it. And Ron had lived it. But I don't know if you're going to like the story, if it's going to you know, resonate with you. And I remember sitting there watching um, the 60 Minutes piece. Has anybody seen the 60 Minutes piece? Do you know that, they, that, was, that was nominated for an Emmy? We didn't win, but it was nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we were watching that 60 Minutes piece here in New York with Leslie Stahl and all the rest of the people. And the book was launched that same exact day. And it, the most cool thing, besides giving birth to triplets, is watching your book on Amazon go from like number 2,000 and you watch it in, in an hour go to number 19. That is cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, for well, an English teacher, that's pretty that's cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a dream come true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK, so that's pretty amazing. Here's another question from, from students. We want to know a little bit about your family relationships now. I, I know your dad is deceased. Um, but in the book, we noticed that your family struggled to support you after the rape and throughout the whole ordeal, really. And were you able to forgive them for not being able to help you through that trauma? And do you have any words of advice for people who are caught in similar circumstances, either? sexual assault victims, people needing and not getting family support, or families and friends of sexual assault victims. Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. say to somebody mm -hmm. who's been assaulted? Mm -hmm. What would you have wanted from your family? Mm -hmm. it was so, you know, my parents were born in 1933 and 1937, and you didn't even talk, you didn't talk about sex from that generation, so you certainly weren't gonna talk about sexual violence. And, um, and so I'm now 54. I don't mind telling you that. Um, I'm now 54. No one in my family has ever talked to me about this. No one's ever talked to me about this, the assault. No one's ever talked to me about what I do now with my life and the work that I'm involved in. Nobody. Um, and so for many years, of course, it, it was very painful. And I struggled with that. But you know, when you talk about forgiveness, like if I'm going to talk about forgiveness, I have to actually live forgiveness. So I had to forgive my family. They did the best that they could, understanding what they could possibly understand. Um, they've not been present for me, but it's not because they don't love me. I think it's just because they just can't be. And, um, and so it, it really became my choice. Do I really want to walk through the rest of my life feeling angry at my family? Do I really, really want to go through my entire life not being able to let go? And, and, I, and I don't want to go through my whole life not being able to let go. Um, I talk, So I work with a lot of assault survivors, a lot, daily. I mean, I was on the phone with one yesterday. Um, my son is trying to support a young woman up in Maine. Um, the reality is if there's, you know, 100 females in this audience, 25 of you have already been assaulted. That's the numbers. And it's pervasive, it's everywhere. Um, so what I would say just to, to anybody who is a support person of a survivor or anyone who's, who has suffered violence or trauma, um, there is no, there's no magic word. And what I try to explain to people, particularly family members, is the best you can do is look at the person and say, I don't know what it's like for you. I don't know your experience. I don't know how you're feeling. But I'm gonna be present for you in any way you need me to be. And that's gonna change hourly. And so, for instance, with my son and this young woman, I said, you know, Blake, you, you probably recognize that one hour she's gonna cry, 
In the next hour, she's not going to want to talk. In the next hour, she's going to want to throw plates up against a dumpster. And those are all okay. And so you're not going to have any magic words. But, to, but what she needs, or he needs, by the way, one out of every nine males is an assault survivor. What they need is your presence and to witness whatever they need you to witness at that moment they need you to witness it. And that's the best you can do. It really is. Right, to make them to make the person feel like they're not in it alone. That's right. Completely that totally you're alone. here. I'm listening. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sharing your space with you. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about your ongoing work with sexual assault victims and just I you know, obviously you just did, but a little bit more about what that's been like for mm. you and what, what you do offer and your, your unique position <coughs> as, a, um, as a victim and a survivor and someone who's, whose life is, is pretty great, pretty together, right? Depends More on who you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, one of the hardest things for, for survivors, you know, it particularly it was for me, was to understand what I call the aftermath of, of violence. And, and I talked about that a little bit when I, when I said, you know, after the trial, I started using a lot of drugs and alcohol. Um, I actually thought that I was recovering bad. I thought I was just a bad survivor. Um, but, but what I really understood was m more often than not, people who have survived violence usually choose a plethora of self-harming things. Drugs, alcohol, um, eating disorders are big, depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, any number of self-harming, and it, it, we usually use a few of those things um, in self-harming. And so what I try to do with, with survivors is sit with them and kind of figure out what self-harming things they're doing, and let's figure out something different that we, where we can channel the harm into something different. And so I have lots of little things in my toolkit that I use for survivors or for people who are supporting them. And they, they, they're just, the first thing I do is try to, to listen and tell them that I get it and I understand and that they're not bad and there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. I mean, there's something wrong with what they're doing, but it's not abnormal with what they're doing. And then we try to figure out different coping strategies, maybe some healthier things that they can do that, um, that they can channel the anger or the, or the sadness. Certainly trying to get them some therapy is a really good idea. I also work with their families, particularly the mothers and their fathers, uh, because they're, they'll call me and say, you know, she's, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with her. But, you know, last year she, she was this way and this year she's yelling at me and she's doing this and she's doing that and trying to get them to understand that their daughter a year ago was not their daughter today and they're gonna have to wrap their mind around that. So, and then the other thing that I try to do is really just meet with them and sit with them and help them figure out how they need to validate their voices. And some of them, it's through criminal prosecution. I just went through a trial with one of them two weeks ago. Um, and, and through others, it might be something different. It might be writing. It might be, you know, coming up with a support group. But some way that they, that they elevate their voice, that they, you know, have their voices validated, and which is a huge part of this the recovery for survivors is feeling that somebody hears their voices. And along those same lines, can you can you talk to us about the position of original crime victims in wrongful conviction cases? Because in in reading and teaching the book, we can easily see that as as Ronald pointed out to you, you were both victims of Bobby Poole. But we can also see that because of the misidentification of Ronald, some people might wrongly criticize you for that mistake, mm -hmm. right? And you, you've spoken of that. So can you talk a bit more about how that has been for you and how you've handled being victimized not once, but over and mm -hmm. over and mm -hmm. over again by the media, by individuals who are uninformed, by the criminal justice system itself? So we have about 1,776 wrongful convictions in this country as of this week. And for every one of those wrongful convictions, there is a crime survivor or murder victim family member. And more often than not, most of these cases have multiple victims. There's multiple you know, murder victims or multiple survivors. 
Um, it's, just, it's generally not just one. So, but let's just say there is one. That means we've got 1,776 survivors or murder victim family members that there's been a wrongful conviction that's come afterwards, right? So you, you, I work with people who 30 years later find out that the person that they thought murdered their daughter really didn't murder their daughter. Or the person they thought raped them and tried to kill them isn't the person that really raped them and tried to kill them. And, and so when, when we talk about the harm, these folks get double harm. There's the original harm that is created from the, from the actual crime, then there's this other collateral harm that happens when the wrongful conviction occurs. But I work with 10 survivors. That means there's 1,766 that I can't find. And there's a reason why I can't find them. It's because they don't want to be found. Because people have this theory that all of the survivors are somehow just kind of haphazardly picking somebody out of a lineup because we don't really care who we're picking out of a lineup. When, when you really, when you logically think about it, why would I have picked out an innocent person out of neglect? I mean, what it was is is my best interest to find the person who raped me. So, I I very much cared about getting it right, but but the media and the public are very cruel to the survivors and murder victim family members. And I can't tell you some of the cruelty that I have heard from survivors and family members that have told me what people have said to them. Things such as, well, if your, if your cousin hadn't been a bartender, she would never have been raped and murdered to begin with. Or from somebody like myself, um, receiving death threats every single year. Someone threatens to find me and kill me. And so the, so the work that I'm, I'm trying to do now is trying to, to, to find these men and women and help them kind of journey back into a place of healing. Because I will tell you, I've never met an exoneree, and I know hundreds that blame the victim. Not one of them blames the victim. They may blame the prosecutor. They might blame the detective. They might blame the defense attorney that was drunk and fell asleep and never visited them you know, before trial. But none of them blame the survivors or their murder victim family member. So it's really uh, um, one of the things I'm trying to do is educate the public and the media as to the harm that is created. I mean, this is, you know, when we talk about wrongful convictions and the harm, um, the, the, the damage is really, really big. It's not just the exoneree that's harmed but it's their families, it's their moms, it's their children that grow up without their dad, it's their, their siblings that grow up without you know, their brother, but it's also the crime survivor, and it's also their family members, and then it's also the community. So when we look at like Ron's in my case, it was myself and my family, it was him and his family, but it's also those other women that were raped when Bobby Poole was left on the street. So we've gotta, what we're trying to do is to kind of change the narrative and how do we look at who is really responsible for wrongful convictions? And, and, the, and the answer is the perpetrator. It's the perpetrator. And then it's the system and how the system is designed to honestly not work. Yeah. Can you... Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the, your ongoing work with your nonprofit called Healing Justice? So Healing Justice, I, is, we're, a, we're a year old this week. Um, I launched it last year. Ron and I received the Special Courage Award from the Department of Justice during Victims Crime Week, which was the first time the Department of Justice has ever acknowledged that people harmed by wrongful convictions are victims that Ron was a victim of, this, of the criminal justice system and I was a victim of the criminal So we, we, we received the Special Courage Award. So I launched Healing Justice then um, because over the last 16 years I've been working in this area and, and working with exonerees and their families and their survivors and their families, what, I was, what was really, really difficult um, was the fact that the harm gets created by the state when the state doesn't act appropriately, when the state fails. And so if the state creates the harm, then it's really the state's obligation to fix it, right? I mean, that would make sense. Like if you break someone's window, you really it should be the person that fixes the window. So the state really should be the 
the entity that fixes the harm, but the states are not fixing the harm. I mean, it would surprise you that 20 some states in our country do not offer any compensation at all. So if you're exonerated in the state of Pennsylvania, which we've got many, you get nothing. You're in for 20 years, you come out and you're 40 years old, you get nothing. If you are in Michigan and you come out 27 years later for a crime you didn't commit, you get nothing. If you're in Wisconsin, you get a cap of $25,000 no matter how long you served. So when we look at the harm, it was really big and nobody was fixing that and it was driving me nuts. I mean, it was just, I mean, I was sitting back scratching my head going, but wait, I mean, if you come out of prison and you did commit the crime, there's probation and parole services. But exonerees don't fit in that and they weren't eligible for that. They weren't eligible for reentry services. They weren't eligible for anything. And then nobody was talking about the crime survivors. And um, so I launched Healing Justice to, in, in an effort to um, kind of repair. Um, and Healing Justice does three things, really. We um, look for ways that we can provide direct support services for those that are harmed by wrongful convictions. And by direct support services, I see that as like a wraparound. So if you can imagine like a community wrapping around a person who's harmed and figuring out what are your needs. Well, for most of our exonerees, it's gonna be mental health. They need physical um, health. They need job training, they need housing, they need, um, they need a car, they need someone to walk them through the, 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 the myriad of paperwork they've got to go through. Um, and, and, and for the crime survivor, a lot of it is mental health and um, some of them will, will be on disability because they've been so harmed. Um, so trying to find ways that we provide direct support services for those that are harmed immediately. As soon as they come out from prison, we have boots on the ground, people ready to kind of wrap around these people and, and, and help. The second thing that we do is we offer retreats. So we did our first retreat in March. Anybody in here see Fernando when he was here in March? Fernando Bermudez? Yeah, he's so great. He and his wife came to our retreat. Um, we bring about 20 folks together and Healing Justice pays for it. And we spend 48 hours in healing circles talking about the trauma and finding ways that we can move from harm into healing using things like art and improv and sharing meals together and laughing together and a lot of crying, a lot of crying. Um, and then the third thing we do is hopefully based on the healing that can take place that we provide um, platforms for your voice. So whatever your needs are, whatever you feel like the system failed you at, that to allow you to advocate for policy reforms that were important to you so that you can, that you find your voice and that your voice is elevated and heard, which is a huge part of the healing process, is that someone hears your voice. So that's what Healing Justice is dedicated to. Um, my executive director, his mother is an exoneree. She was, um, she was sent to prison for life for first degree murder. She had a chemistry master's degree. Her boyfriend ended up committing suicide, but the police officer decided that he was gonna make it a homicide. And she was like, she's, she was a grandmother. She was 55 years old. She was sentenced to life um, for first degree murder and her daughter went to law school and was able to exonerate her mother. And that's a great story. And um, so Katie Monroe is my executive director, so we kind of are this force. We're two little tiny girls running around just making all kinds of problems for the criminal justice system. So but we're having a great time doing it. <laughs> we're having a great time doing it. Um, so yeah, that's what Healing Justice does, and it's really amazing. Yeah, that's amazing work, and there's a lot of it to do. There's a lot of it to a do. A lot. And you know, we're having an exoneration in this country every three days somewhere in this country every three days. But the reality of that, while we can say, well, that's great, right? We've got an exoneration every three days in this country. 5% of, of, our, of, our, um, of our prison population, so we've got 2.3 million people in prison. And y'all do not ask me to do math because I've already proved that I can't do it. But 5% of our prison population is actually innocent. That means they weren't even there. They had nothing to do with it. So we know that in our prison population right now, and 5% is conservative, it's probably much bigger than that, but we don't want to scare people. 
But that means 100,000 people right now in America's prisons are innocent. And we're going to be able to save a tiny, tiny number of those. And most of our innocent men and women that are wrongfully convicted will die behind those bars. And it is a huge problem. Because we know for every wrongful conviction, we've left the true perpetrator out on the streets. And that's the other side of this. And we call that wrongful liberty. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about mm -hmm. when you were talking about the, the widening circles of mm -hmm. harm mm -hmm. created by wrongful conviction. When real perpetrators are allowed to go free, mm -hmm. More, many more people can be harmed. It's t it's really it's really terrible. We had a an exoneree um, in March at the retreat, and the survivor and, and he have met, and they're they're forming a very close you know friendship. Um, and I work with both of them, and he came, and he had been it was a rape charge. He was in prison for 14 years, was finally exonerated. It's in the state of Oklahoma, um, no compensation. Comes out after 14 years. And it took over a decade for them to meet. They met. Um, the DNA test is run through CODIS, finally, to figure out who actually committed the rape and started the whole wrongful conviction. They figure out who it is. Statue of limitations are run out. He doesn't get charged. And, when I, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that right now he is walking the beach. He's a free man. He's walking on the beach free man, and we know that he, that, that not only did he commit that crime, but weeks after he committed her rape, he raped a 13-year-old little girl. Statute of limitations. Big problem. That big, needs to be eliminated. Big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can tell us uh, a little bit about, we know there's a huge problem. What can we do about it? Good question. How many people here are registered to vote? Great, great. Okay, that's the first thing. Register to vote and then go vote. Okay? I don't care who you vote for, just go vote. I actually do care who you vote for, but, um, but I'm not going to start on that one. <laughs> um, the primaries are this week here, right? All right, did you vote? Yes. yes. Okay, that's the first thing. Register to vote and then vote. Because who we're putting into office that are making these laws, like, we're putting them there, right? We're putting these people there. So if we don't like what they're doing, you have a voice, do something about it and advocate for change. I mean, that's, that's part of your, um, your, your obligation as a citizen. So that's the first thing I would tell you. Know who you're putting into office, and if you don't like it, do something about it. Write letters. Write op-ed pieces for the newspaper. I mean, get involved. Um, as far as things such as wrongful convictions, I mean, you know, there's a, you've, got a, you've got the biggest innocence project in New York. Did you guys know that? The biggest innocence project in New York. Volunteer. They're looking for volunteers. If you got $5 extra every month, Send it to them. Um, get involved at, at the grassroots level in your own community. There's lots of different ways that you can get involved. And, and we were talking about this earlier at lunch, but you know, we, we're talking about wrongful convictions, but, the, but mass incarceration issues in this country are really serious. Like we've made a, we've made a tremendous mess. We've got a mess. Um, and so at the grassroots level, go in and, and be a big brother, a big sister. Get involved with kids. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can be a part and be a change agent. And so I would, what I would say is figure out what your passion is, whether it's children or animals or women's issues or, or homelessness or whatever it is, and then, and then commit yourself to that passion. Um, I don't want all of you working in wrongful convictions. I really don't. Um, but I do. But I would want you to be involved in something that makes a difference and, and is meaningful to you, and makes an impact um, in the wider circle around you. And each one of us has that ability and that gift. 
So, and if, and if somebody's out there helping with the children and somebody's out, out there helping with the women and somebody's out there helping with the homeless, or you know, a lot of our wrongful convictions um, begin with people of color, poverty, and mental illness. I promise you they are not arresting wealthy white men. They're not. They're not arresting wealthy white men. Well, they might be, but they're going to be in federal prison on white collar crimes. But, but it's, it's the people, it's, it's what we call people that are on the margins are the people that get caught up in these wrongful convictions. And so get involved in your community homeless shelter or any, anything like that that's in your neighborhood that, that impacts your life. And get involved in, in, um, and, and dedicate you know, your passion to that. And you know what, you'd be surprised um, what you find yourself doing in 10 years. Yeah, I advocate for that too. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem, right? <laughs> so we have, do we have Susan Reichert out there somewhere? Yes. Do you want to come up? Yes. So thank you, Jennifer. We're going to end this part of the program, and Susan Reichert is going to do a little small presentation now, and then Oops. we're going to have book signings. So hold on. Thank you. I'm a, I never did this before. I'm honored to be here today to represent the Queensboro faculty, students, and staff with respect to this project. When reading about your journey of forgiveness, Jennifer, and listening to you speak today, one cannot help but be deeply moved by the wondrous attributes possessed by you and Ronald and exhibited during that journey. Virtues that exemplify dignity and courage and led ultimately to forgiveness and healing. Inspired by your stories, the Queensboro staff, faculty, and students initiated what we have named the Healing Blanket Project. Funded completely by Queensboro, this undertaking had two simple requirements, caring hands and patches made of cotton whose colors and prints carefully chosen to symbolize the beautiful attributes of both you and Ronald, grace, mercy, compassion, faith, hope, patience, to name a few. Patches that weave together by our community of caring hands into tapestries of healing that will be donated to crisis centers for victims of assault and rape. We hope that those blankets will bring comfort to those victims as they journey on their path to healing. It's with great pleasure that we present one to you, Jennifer, and hope that you'll bring one to Ronald. We applaud you for your courage and your strength. I want you to know that your story will reach out to so many others through these blankets. The top patches is embroidered with Queensboro Community College, and on the back is our signature that says, you don't have to show that, made with love by QCC faculty, students, and staff, imprinted there, just like your story will be imprinted in our hearts forever. It's very comfortable. I just want to take this opportunity to thank um, President Diane Call for authorizing the funding of this project, and to the Queensboro Nursing Department, who really went over and beyond and created so many blankets. Um, my students alone created at least three, and it's been a wonderful project, very rewarding, and thank you.
Thank you so much. That's wonderful. That's really sweet. Thank you. So now we're going to do the book signing portion. Uh, we're going we're gonna to call up row by row. We're going to start with the first row, go to number two, number three, so on and so forth. Jennifer is going to sit behind the table here, and there are going to be pens. <laughs> there are going to be pens. And could we have the ushers, please, deal with um, calling up row one, two, three, et cetera? Thank you.